This Sunday, we're going to do something a little different. I'm going to do a one-off sermon uh, called Living with Dual Citizenship because we've kind of been thinking about that sort of thing uh, lately. Next Sunday, I'm going to start an, a new series about Old Testament Bible stories because there's a lot of just great Old Testament Bible stories. It's fun in the summer to kind of walk through those. Uh, but we've been kind of celebrating our country. I've been firing off fireworks to all hours of the night. I want to do a quick survey. Uh, how many of you, there were fireworks going off around your house after midnight? Oh, yeah. Okay, how many after uh, 1230? Okay, one, 130, two, three. Holy mackerel. Okay, I'm just going to stop there because I don't want to know after that. Uh, we, you know, it's been a big deal kind of lately. Um, so do, if we have some kids in here, we have some of our children, I want to ask you, um, what, what was the best part of 4th of July for our children? Just shout out what the best thing was for you. Not having the pastor ask us questions. That was the best thing. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll uh, go over that. We, we are so blessed, really, to be citizens of the United States. Amen? I mean, we just, you know, and whether if you're just here as a resident of that, to be a part of the United States is a, is a tremendous sort of gift, and we've been celebrating our freedom. We have a wonderful country. I love our country. I know it's not perfect. But we really do have a wonderful country. And if you've traveled around the world, you'll understand uh, how blessed we are to be a part of the the United States and and uh, and have our citizenship and and be a part of this larger sort of thing. But it's it's both a blessing and a responsibility, isn't it? We citizenship comes with great gifts and and great responsibility. And so we want to kind of talk a little bit uh, about this. Uh, in, In in Paul's time, when the Bible was written, the greatest country in the world was anyone know? Rome, yeah, it was a massive empire. It was what everybody wanted to be a part of, uh, and, and it was a, an important sort of thing. And only one of the apostles that we know of had Roman citizenship. Roman citizenship was very hard to get, but the apostle Paul um, actually was a Roman citizen. Uh, and so he, uh, he kind of talks about that a little bit, and he makes some unique analogies to what it is to be a follower uh, of Jesus uh, f- for us as well. Uh, he enjoyed uh, being a part of Israel because he was born a Jew, and he enjoyed being a part uh, of Rome because, of his, because he was a part of a, he was the descendant of a Roman citizen, so he inherited uh, his citizenship. He had this dual citizenship. Any of you have dual citizenship? Do we have anybody with dual citizenship? Yep, we got... One, we had several in the eight o'clock service. It's a great, yeah, another one there. It's a great privilege to have, to have dual citizenship. And for those of you who have dual citizenship, now you're going to find out you have triple citizenship. I don't know what the, what they would call that. But, but there's a sense in which you have a, you have citizenship here and you have citizenship in heaven. And so, uh, Paul, when he writes to the Philippians, talks about this idea of citizenship and how it relates uh, to being followers of Jesus and how it relates for us. And so I, I want us to look at it. It's found in Philippians chapter 3. Um, and if you have your Bibles, you can look there. But I, I want to, I'll put this, the scripture up. And I just, I just kind of want to warn you. Uh, Paul kind of goes down before he comes up. And so the verse I'm about to read is going to kind of leave in you like, I got up for this, you know. Uh, and so I, I just want to start you out there. And just remember, Paul has dual citizenship. He understands of these sorts of of things, okay? So in Philippians chapter 3, he writes this, For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, hold on to that idea, tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomachs, and their glory is their shame. That means they take glory in things that are shameful. Their mind is set on earthly things, okay? That's the kind of verse that just doesn't make you go yay and amen at the end of it. But what Paul is doing is he's describing the situation at Philippi at that point. Uh, Philippi was a... Um, a Roman outpost, a Roman uh, kind of city, uh, but but like Rome, it, it had all of the good and all of the bad, and there's a lot of wickedness in Roman cities in ways that just go beyond what you can possibly uh, imagine today, uh, the, the brutality, uh, slavery, uh, sexual sins of every kind and shape that you would ever think of, and things probably, hopefully, you've never thought of before, were, were a part of this. And to, to these Christians at Philippi, they had to live in the midst midst of this and the, all this stuff that surrounded them. And, and what Paul is saying in this passage is, sinners, sin. Get over it. 
they're going to sin. You're going to be surrounded by all kinds of stuff that's painful and difficult. You live in a world where people are not going to follow God, uh, where you're going to see stuff that just breaks your heart uh, through all of this. And and so he, he's saying to them, he's acknowledging, you live in a world where not very many people follow God. Very few people would have been Christians in that environment. It would have been very difficult for them. And so the message to them and to us is, is kind of this idea is, is you just need to adjust the fact that you live in an unchristian society. And in many ways, I thought there's some timeliness to that kind of a message coming out of Paul. That, that, that as much as I love my country and, and many things were kind of built on, on Christian values, we live in a world where our country is increasingly moving away from values of Christ. It, it just is. We just live in that kind of world. There's all kinds of things going on around us. And you can pick whatever your favorite example of that is. But, but the world is just changing all the way from Supreme Court rulings that we're not comfortable with to burning church in the South to, to slavery that's allowed and all, all kinds of just crazy stuff that goes on in the world in which we live. And so Paul was acknowledging that life is hard. You are surrounded by people that, that do awful, terrible things. But the interesting point that I want to kind of get in this verse and the reason I had tears underlined there is that's Paul's attitude towards that. Paul, when he looked around and he saw all the brokenness and all the shameful things that we're doing, I, I love that verse. They, they glory in their shame. They, they take pride in doing things that are shameful and, and, and destructive. Sometimes our response is anger. But Paul's response was tears. It broke his heart when he looked around and he saw people that were doing things that were destructive, when they were involved in things that were far for the kingdom, involved in things that would take them down paths of hurt and, and pain and, and, and shame. And I think it's important that we, we remember that. We just live in an age, and I'm probably going to get myself in trouble here, but we live in an age where there are far too many angry Christians. They're just They're just mad and they're angry and they say stuff and they they do stuff Uh, can we allow our hearts to be broken over sin rather than to attack sinners can we be a people that that cry tears that's what jesus did he looked over jerusalem and and that was much more godly but he saw the sin and he cried for jerusalem and that's what what paul's saying here he's not saying that that, 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 the sin is okay he's saying it breaks my heart that I live in a world where there's so much of that kind of stuff. We should have the attitude of Christ, the attitude of Paul, of, of tears when we see the brokenness. And then he goes on to give us some advice about how to live in this world where you're surrounded by, by people that don't follow God and surrounded by sin and surrounded by things that would pull you the wrong way and, and would end in your destruction. In verse 20 he says, But... But is a really good word because it means all that stuff that came before, I have a better plan. But, but our citizenship, and that's a really important word, is in, tell me the word, heaven. And we eagerly await a savior. Hold on to the word savior because we're going to talk about that. From there, from heaven, we eagerly await a savior from heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, that's who our savior is, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, that's an important phrase. Paul is doing a really cool thing I'm going to explain to you in just a minute here. We'll transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Praise be to God. Yeah, the body that mine's going to be taller and thinner, better looking, you know, it's going to be better at music, it's going to have a better memory for sure, you know, okay. One day we, we get all that. And so, so I, now let me just kind of pull this verse apart here a little bit, and we'll talk about this. The, the citizenship piece is a, is a, is a really uh, big deal, because Philippi was a place where Roman citizenship was, was, a lot of people had it in Philippi, and they were very proud of it, and they lived far away uh, from um, from all of the rest of Rome, you know, and so it was something that, that, that protected them and kind of guided them, and inside Philippi, the rules of Rome applied. You could, you could go to a magistrate if you'd been accused of something, and you would be judged by Roman rules, not by the rules of 
the pagans that were around them and all the outside forces. You could, you could get Roman justice. You had Roman rights. You had Roman privileges in, in all of that. And so the people of Philippi were very, very proud of that. And so they, when, when Paul uses the word citizenship, it really communicated something to them. Okay. And so Paul is saying, you guys, you, you Philippians, you have Roman citizenship. A lot of them would have Roman citizenship. But he says, more important than that, you have another citizenship. You are dual citizens. You are heavenly. You have heavenly citizenship. And that's the citizenship that really, really matters. And there's some, there's some things in between heavenly citizenship and earthly citizenship that, that will help you understand how we're supposed to, to, to live here. And so I need to explain to you a little bit uh, about Romans, uh, excuse me, explain to you about Roman citizenship because it was a really big deal for them. Roman citizenship came with some very important privileges and protections that were especially important if you didn't actually live in Rome. And if you remember the Roman Empire, it was just everywhere. They just expanded out and they would establish Roman cities and all of that sort of thing. Well, Philippi is kind of on the edge of civilization. You know, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there kind of a thing. And they were surrounded by all kinds of hostile sorts of forces uh, that, that were hostile to Rome and eventually bring down Rome in some ways. Um, And so it was kind of a dangerous place to live. And yet they were this outpost of Rome and this this place where Roman rules were there and these Roman citizens. Uh, And and that was important to them because even though they were surrounded by this hostile environment, they always knew because they were citizens, they had an anchor in that foreign land back to the thing that really mattered, back to Rome. It was kind of the the thing they held on to. And if any of you have ever traveled internationally, you kind of understand this experience. You know, you kind of have your U.S. passport, and you spend a lot of time in a foreign country, and especially if there aren't very many people that speak your language and understand your customs, it's kind of your anchor. This is what gets me back into the United States and gets me home, you know? And, and if you've lived there, if you, if you stay very long, I've had the privilege of, uh, several times of spending extended stays, uh, weeks, uh, in a foreign country. After a while, you begin to really kind of crave that. You know, I'd be in a market, and if I heard somebody speak in English, I'm like, hey, you know? Because, you, you, you know... I, I wish I spoke more than one language, and every country does this. If you go, if people that don't speak English come here, they're attracted to people that speak their language, uh, you know. But, but but there's a sense in which your citizenship becomes an anchor for the reality that whatever is going on here, you're connected to something else. There, there's something more. There's something else out there uh, that, that you can hold on to to in the midst of all of that. When you're, when you're in a foreign land, when you're in Philippi, which is far from Rome, you know that because you're a citizen, you are still connected to Rome. And so the idea here is that it's an outpost of, of Rome. It's an outpost of that place. That, that in the midst that's surrounded by non-Rome, here it's Rome. And, and when I think about this, I, I'm going to make a little confession here. I, I kind of think about the old spaghetti westerns. Any of you remember watching westerns as a kid? You know, that some of you that are old enough. You know, John Wayne and all of that sort of thing. And they always had the fort. It always, you know, there's a fort something somewhere, you know. And, and that was always kind of confusing to me because, you know, if, if they had like a fort in Kansas, they always had these like, these like timbers that were, that went up, that, that lined them up, you know, and they were sharp on the top. You ever been to Kansas? There are no trees like that. I have no idea where they got those timbers for that. But they always had timbers, you know, this giant wall and this pokey things on top, you know, so that so that things went bad. You could go in the fort and you could close the doors and, and you would be protected and you kind of waited for the cavalry to show up to, to kind of protect you. And, and that same idea is what's happening at Philippi. If you were a Roman city and you had Roman citizenship, if the armies were to come and were to attack Philippi, they knew that if they could close up the gates and, and, and stay together, eventually they would send a, a messenger to Rome and sooner or later the Roman army would show up and protect them. And everybody knew that. So you didn't protect, you didn't attack the Roman outposts because if you did, sooner or later you would be dealing with the Roman army and nobody wanted to deal with the Roman army. So one of the benefits is that citizenship means protection. It means that, that there's more to you than just what you can see, feel, and touch. That, that it looks like these people are defenseless. It looks like they're on their own. They're out in the midst, surrounded by enemies, surrounded by all this stuff. But ultimately, the Roman army guarantees their protection. And if you harm them, you're going to face the Roman army. And so Paul kind of used that to talk to these Christians in Philippi. Um, 
uh, about the fact that they had they had certainly Roman citizenship, and that was good. He was proud of his Roman citizenship. I'm proud of my American citizenship. But citizenship in heaven carries some benefits too. That, that, that there's something that God wants to do because you are citizens of heaven. In fact, you notice it said they eagerly await a Savior. And I'm going to have to dig into this verse with the language because Paul creates some really creative pictures, but it's hard to get it in English. You have to get it in the original language. The interesting thing Paul did when he chose that word for Savior, in Greek there are several different words for Savior that mean Savior. And this, there's only two places where he did this. He deliberately chose a word for Savior that the Romans used to refer to the emperor as a god. So listen to the picture he draws. He says, you citizens of Rome... You think your savior is the emperor, that he's going to come and take care of you. But I am here to tell you that the citizens of heaven have a savior too. And he's the one that can really save your souls. Isn't that cool? cool? We we think that the army is going to save us. They're like, the army's nothing. I know everybody's afraid of the Roman army, but the emperor is not your savior. Jesus Christ is your savior. And so when you are surrounded by all sorts of things that don't make sense and you see society going the wrong way and you don't know what to do with all of that and, and it feels like you're under attack and you don't feel safe and, and you're, you're afraid in the midst of all of this, know this, Jesus Christ is your emperor. He is your savior and it is the army of heaven that watches out for you. That, that's good news, man. That is, that is good news. And it's so brave of Paul because he's literally taking a poke at the Roman emperor, which was quite dangerous in those days. But he wanted to say, the government will never save you. Now, now I I don't know if this comes as a surprise to you. Our politicians are never going to save us, folks. I hate to break it to you, but it ain't going to happen. And that's not to say anything against politicians. The Lord bless followers of Jesus that go into politics. I could not do that. I'm thankful for that. But our hope, our Savior, will never be politics. It will never be the Congress. It will never be the President. It will never be the Supreme Court. It will never be Olympia. It will never be... I don't care how much they promise. And you think, well, if my party only had more power. The emperor had absolute power. The point is, the government, Rome will never, ever save you. Our Savior is Jesus Christ. And that's so important that we get a hold of that because our safety comes from that. So everybody, everybody take a deep breath. Go, now let it out. You have a Savior from heaven. So relax. It's okay. God is still in charge. There's a little meme going around on Facebook that says, whoever the president is, God is still king. Praise be to God. You know, that it's just relax. God's army is protecting you. And, and kind of, there's this, kind of this wonderful image here that, that, that you know, the Romans, that the Roman army would come. When you're under attack, when you feel like you're oppressed and, and, and things are coming after you, I want you to know that the army of the living God is coming for you. And I really think sometimes if we could see things spiritual, we would be amazed at how many encounters we have with angels and how much the, the army of the Lord is around us. I've gotten so when I pray for people that are going into surgery or sick, I'll say, Lord, just fill that surgery up, wingtip to wingtip angel. I, I think that may be true. I think that the army of the Lord is around us all the time. Our hope will never be in government or military or any of that things, the stuff of this earth. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that will save us ultimately. And interestingly, when he talks about um, that that he's going to put all things under his control, the Greek word there, again, is really strong. We kind of think of all things as like, yeah, almost all of it. But in Greek, it means like every single little detail. It's a really strong word that means he will miss nothing. Virtually everything will be under God's control. That's the kind of protector I want, personally. I mean, you guys like this idea? I mean, is this a good thing, you know? It is. And so so then he goes on to say, verse verse 4, he says this, Therefore, I love that, that's another one of those good. Therefore, because of all of the things I've told you, because you are citizens of heaven, because God is your protector, in the midst of all the craziness that's going around you, you're worried about the, the burnings of churches in the South, you're worried about the Supreme Court, you're worried about the Congress, you're worried about society, you're worried about, worried about, worried, worried about. In, in light of all of that, God is your protector. You are citizens of heaven. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. Last week we talked about crowns. 
Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Now you need to understand the context of standing firm. If you know the story about Paul and Philippi, they tried to kill him in Philippi and God did a miracle and delivered him out of jail. But we believe that probably the attitude towards Christians at Philippi would have been very negative. They probably faced persecution. It would not have been okay to be a Christian. They were a small minority in a very large place that was heavily militarized. And and so when he says stand firm, he, he means in the midst of all of that sort of stuff, stand firm. Why are you afraid you have the army of the Lord? The Philippians were not afraid of the people around them because they had the army of the army of Rome. You have the army of Lord. What are you afraid of? You know, God is in charge in in all of this. And, And I know it's hard, he's saying, but trust God through all of this. In fact, he reminds them, you are citizens of heaven. Now live like it. Sinners sin, but that's not who you are. You live by a higher standard. You live by the kingdom standards. You're an outpost of the kingdom and the rules of God's kingdom apply in your lives. See, in the church, we operate by the rules of the kingdom of God. That's why in society, it may be okay to slander one another and talk bad to one another, but in the body of Christ, that is not okay. We treat one another like Christ has treated us. We're an outpost of the kingdom. The rules of the kingdom are in this place. So stand firm. Because if you could see what's standing behind you, it's a giant angel of the Lord with a fiery sword. He's watching out for you. So let me give you quickly some some action steps, some, some citizen action steps. You are citizens of the kingdom, okay? Number one, worry less about Rome and think more about heaven. Worry less about Rome and think more about heaven. There are far too many followers of Jesus that worry a lot about Washington, D.C. and don't think nearly enough about heaven. And when you do that, it kind of gets things out of whack and you begin to worry and you get concerned about all of that. And then Christians get all worked up. I am meeting Christians more and more that are all worked up and they're so angry and they're, they're have you heard about this? You know about that? And, yeah, da, 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 and the world is falling. Pretty soon their eyes are bulging and the, the vein on their head is poking out and I'm thinking, I'm going to have to do CPR here in a minute. You know? And I want to say to them, the emperor is not in charge. God is. He's, he's the one that's, he knows what our Supreme Court does. He knows what our, our Congress does. He knows what our president does. He knows what all of that stuff, and he is still in charge. Why are you focusing on that stuff? The negative, the ugly, the, the hurtful. Take your eyes off of Rome and get it on heaven. In fact, sometimes I think worry is an indicator that we really don't entirely trust God. This very context, this very people that he's talking about where they're under persecution, they're under attack. This two verses later from this, in chapter 4, uh, verse 4, Paul writes some really powerful words. Understand, they're in a difficult situation, a more difficult situation than ours, by the way, by a ton. And he writes some words to them. I want to read it to you, and I want you to close your eyes and just listen and let these words wash over you. Keep in mind, these were wor- written to people that are facing worse situations than you. This is Paul, who was nearly killed in this place, and this is what he says to the citizens of the kingdom. Rejoice in the Lord Always. Always. Again, I say, he repeats it, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. You see that? That the army of the Lord is behind you. He's right next to you. You can reach out. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And all God's people said, that's what he wants us to focus on. He, he, he never said, focus on the government because eventually you'll fix it. It'll be okay if you just put enough time and energy on that. 
He said, think about your citizenship in heaven. And so, so the second verse, piece I give to you, lecture about politics less and love individuals more. Love people. That's what it's all about. There's a, um, a thing I, I don't even know where I heard it from originally, but, but I just, I've come to love it. And it says, God is the judge. The Holy Spirit is the convictor of sin. And we're supposed to love people. We like to turn that upside down sometimes. We want to play judge. And we want to make sure that they get under enough conviction, taking over the role of the Holy Spirit. And boy, I sure hope God loves you because I'm not too sure. No, it's the opposite. Love people. That's why his heart was broken because he loved them and he wanted Christ for them. And we live by different rules. We're, we're supposed to return good for evil. We're supposed to turn the other cheek. We're supposed to go the extra mile. We're supposed to love like Jesus. That's what he says. Lecture less about politics. Love individuals more. I hate to break it to you. You are never going to change the government. But if you love your neighbor like Jesus, you might change them. And when we do enough of that, we change the world through all of this. Vote your conscience. Live your faith. Vote your conscience. Live their faith. That's the way he calls it to do. Spend your time and energy on loving the people around you, on loving your neighbor. I have a friend who likes to say, do you want to make a point or do you want to make a difference? Way too many folks trying to make a point at the expense of making a difference. When I get to the end of my life, and you need to know I am wired to argue. I was captain of my, my debate team. Somebody looked it up the other day and they said, you really were captain of your debate team. Yes, I was. I love to make a point. That's part of the reason I became a preacher. But if all I ever do in life is make a point and I never make a difference, it's not worth it. Let's, let's make less points and make more of a difference in our world. And then number three, pray for Rome, live for Jesus. Pray for Rome, live for Jesus. You know that we are instructed to pray for those in authority over us, even if they're from the wrong political party. It doesn't say unless they're uh, filling your political party that you're opposed to. Even, even if we don't like them, we're supposed to pray for them. In fact, we need to pray for them when we don't like them more than any other time. Amen? Pray for Rome, but live for Jesus. I, I really believe that, you know, the gospel, the, the word gospel actually means good news. That's what it means literally. And, and when, when Jesus encountered people who are far from God, living terrible, wicked lives, they were attracted to him. What if we could be the people that sinners are attracted to because they say, those people just love us and care for us. Add value to people. Live for Jesus. And then finally, earthly citizenship is good, but heavenly citizenship is better. God is your emperor. He's the one that's in charge. Live like him and trust the rest to God. Live for him and trust the rest for God in the midst of all of that sort of stuff. And so this morning we're going to close our service at the Lord's table together because this is ultimately a symbol of our citizenship in heaven. There's so many things we've talked about this that are represented in this. And one of them is, by the way, I forgot to mention, one of the best benefits about being a citizen of heaven, one day you're going to live there forever. Woohoo! Yeah, I may be your neighbor. I can see you're not getting too psyched about that. But we are going to live there forever, you know, in, in heaven. There's one, one last thing I want to make about this. I told you that Philippi was made up largely of citizens of Rome. What I did not tell you is that a huge percentage of them were retired military from the Roman army. Because in the Roman army, if you would give 21 years of service, you would be rewarded with Roman citizenship with all its privileges and all of its protections. And so men would make a deal and they would join the army and very few of them would actually make it. A lot of them died in the process. They would literally risk their lives that they might hold on to this thing called Roman citizenship for the last part of their life. They might have this. That's how, how valuable it was. That was the cost of Roman citizenship was 21 years in a brutal army. The cost of your heavenly citizenship was the broken body of Christ and the shed blood. You cannot earn your heavenly citizenship. It can only be given to you as a free gift. And on this weekend when we celebrate our citizenship in a great country in the United States, I want us to celebrate our citizenship in heaven that was given to us by our Father. And so when you come in just a minute, I want you to remember, give thanks for our country. Pray for our leaders. 
But I want you to come to the Eucharist. That's one of the names. It's a Latin name for the communion, and it means we give thanks. And give thanks for what God has given to you. You are citizens of the kingdom. And if you're not, I'd like to talk to you. Because, boy, have I got a deal for you. Amen. If those who are going to help us with the Lord's table would come and begin to serve themselves, I'm going to ask God's blessing upon his table. And then we're going to invite you to come. If you come down this aisle and those two and then back the others there. And the gluten-free will be over on the far side, uh, over here on this side uh, as well. And I'm going to ask, uh, Becky, could you help us so we can have some more here? Some of our elders, uh, we want to kind of get through this here. Um, let me pray. Father God, Lord, I'm so thankful that I live in the United States. I'm reminded that Paul was proud of his Roman citizenship, Father. I know our country isn't perfect, but Father, I ask your blessing upon it. And I pray that you would speak to our leaders, Father, and that you would make yourself known to them and that they would follow you and the policies, Father. But ultimately, I am so thankful that my hope does not rest in my politicians. My hope rests in you, Father. And so I pray, Father, now that as we come to this Eucharist, this celebration of thanksgiving together as the body of Christ, that you would give us hearts of thanksgiving for what you have done for us in Jesus. That, Father, you would help us to live as citizens of the kingdom in this outpost. I know we're surrounded by all this stuff, and I know for some it's very scary and it's fearful, but, but remind us that you're in charge and help us to focus on the things that you would have us to focus on. And so we come now with gratitude to your table. We're reminded that on the night the Lord was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks for it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is broken for you. Whenever you do this, remember. After supper, he took the cup and when he again gave him thanks, he gave it to them saying, this is the new covenant in my blood which was shed for you. Whenever you do this, remember. Remember who you are as citizens of the kingdom. Remember the price of your citizenship. It was more than you could afford. It was only a free gift. Remember that it is the army of heaven that protects you, not the army of our government. Remember that one day we're going to take this in heaven together and we are going to live forever. Remember, remember, remember. The body and blood of Jesus Christ preserve us blameless unto everlasting life. Let us come to the table of the Lord.